Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. This is episode number 189 with my guest Gloria Yehalevsky. This is Gloria's second time back on the podcast. We met during the quarantine during my CoronaCast series and we chatted about things such as mental health, insecurity, uh, finding your place in the field, that sort of stuff. And it was just nice to get to catch up with Gloria and see where she's at now um, many months later. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. I always do. Uh, without further ado, this is Gloria Yehalevsky. Take care. Bye. We're, we're here. Um, well, listen, um, are you ready to gavel this to order? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, okay. Um, well, Gloria Yehalevsky, am I saying I, I pronounced it correctly? It's great. Okay. Good job. All right. Well, I am really grateful, actually, to get to talk to you again because um, I feel like we spoke uh, – just to make sure I have it. Yeah, I feel like we spoke during another lifetime – the last time we spoke am i yeah, is yeah, that I'm, I'm really excited for this because it's like you're gonna meet a different gloria today <laughs> well you're gonna meet a different josh perhaps i was you know uh, just in the interest of full disclosure we were the last we spoke was during i had this corona cast series where i was just talking to people during the the quarantine and i don't exactly remember how we hooked up online but maybe just a random message but I think it was Facebook, yeah. Yeah, and we, we spoke a bit about just some of the stuff you're working on. Um, we talked a little bit. We touched on some anxiety and, like, depression, mental health issues, things like that. And we had messaged a bit prior to this about talking about some of the new stuff you have that you're working on right now. Um, I, I I haven't dug super deep into it, but I've been seeing the That's collaborations okay. you've been doing, you so I'm, I want to hear about them. <laughs> but, um, you know, you reached out for this particular podcast because I had put a note out just saying – happy to chat with folks and i'm curious like what how do what do you want to what do you want to start with today what are you working on what do you want how do you want to what do you want to chat about we can go anywhere um no yeah so i reached out again because i have a kickstarter that i'm promoting that's right i've been going like marketing crazy um which has actually been something that like in most in most facets of our lives, we feel really awkward about, we're like, you know, anything we post on social media to advertise what we're doing to get mm -hmm. people to pay money for what we do. It's always like, I don't know, you, you're just afraid of how people are going to react. And I have not had that experience at all with this project. It's Good. been incredible. Like I've been DMing people like crazy and like unapologetically just because it's like, it's, this is the, I don't know if you follow Gary V at all, but I was like, mm -hmm. Oh, this is what he's talking about. Cause I'm um, Gary Vaynerchuk. He's he's like a motivational speaker, okay. entrepreneur guy. Um, like he's really great with mindset. That's why I like him. Really oh, okay. positive mindset. Awesome. Well, what is what? Tell me about this project. What exactly? Uh, so, this did this project come about since we had last spoke, or was it something you had been working on um, already? It was. It was kind of simmering. It was around um, when we last spoke, but it really like lit up in the past um it was supposed to happen in november december and i was supposed so it's with a lot of collaborators and friends who i work with in england mm -hmm. and i was gonna fly over there that was the original plan mm -hmm. and then it became okay i'm not gonna fly over there and then england went into lockdown and we're and then it postponed to march um which is actually now we i just finished recording this weekend they recorded last week um, so it's actually, it's a thing <laughs> awesome. It exists. Um, well, well, tell me about it. Tell me so, about the project yeah. and then tell me about what the Kickstarter is specifically doing to support the project. Right. So it's called Dreamerfly and other stories. It's with, um, so it started with myself and an animator, she e. Lee, she mm -hmm. and I worked on another, a shorter project. It was about 13 minutes called minister of loneliness. I mm -hmm. wrote the music and she, created like we sent her recordings of the music and then she created animations based off of that mm. and we did a live performance mm -hmm. where basically the animation is for the performers like a click track that was how we worked with it oh nice okay. um so it was very it was very very challenging it was like super process oriented like we just had we had never done this before we're just figuring it out kind of thing um and then the second one it's you know we learned a lot we went okay we're gonna use a click track this time so mm -hmm. we can actually line everything up Mm -hmm. um and somebody else james Austin, he's a jazz bassist he wrote the music and i asked him to specifically for this project idea because the initial idea had to do with space elliptical galaxies which are where in a spiral galaxy the milky way is a spiral galaxy elliptical mm -hmm. galaxies are very chaotic and just like it's hard they, they make up 80 percent of the universe or 70 80 i don't know the exact numbers um and then i just when i learned about that i loved it because 
I was like, oh, this is what our lives are like. They just don't make any sense. And of course, like the crazy, like the chaotic and crazy ones would make up more of the space that we exist in than the organized and perfect ones. Like that just makes so much sense to me. Um, but it became very much like that was just a seed. And then it became mm. like she went with it and she um, ended up with a story based on a Chinese philosophy called a butterfly dream. Mm -hmm. And that philosophy is where a man has a dream that he is a moth that he's flying around or a butterfly or a moth, whatever you want to think of it as. Mm -hmm. And then this, a butterfly or a moth has a dream that they're a person, that they're a man. Um, and the idea of this is that we don't know who's dreaming and who is mm. real, like who's actually living this. Um, and so that was kind of the basis. And then she took this story and then is like wrapping a few different stories into the entire work, which is a 45 minute multimedia performance. Awesome. So it's um, so her, her work, it's like abstract expression. So it's not going to be like, story like man goes to sleep has a dream goes in his car does something. it's not like that it's very like you'll see characters and things will come in and out and mm -hmm. so you'll get perceptions and feelings from it but it's not going to be like beginning middle end kind of thing it's going to be very much feeling based and um just it goes back to this chaotic idea like there are five movements struggle loss lonely balance and rebirth mm -hmm. and so it goes back into these like life cycles and whatever you want to think if you're a spiritual person and you think of um, rebirth as or reincarnation if that's something that you think about then mm -hmm. you might resonate with that but there are a lot of different pieces and components that go back to the chaos of life and go back to this like searching for yourself and searching for meaning which was something that you and i talked about a little bit mm -hmm. last time mm -hmm. um and well, so it's it's all of these concepts like embedded into abstract expressionist work like what the artists feel about that did um did the does the theme of uh, i mean i'm as you were talking about like spiral galaxies and stuff i have a very sort of um i would call it a hobby hobby-esque um cool. i don't i'm not an expert but i love things like quantum entanglement and like the hubble deep field um do you know about the hubble deep field images no this, i I've gone as far as like reading a few New York Times articles about. Oh, it's stuff, well, it's not really so the Hubble telescope. The Hubble telescope every year there's like a um, there's a new person who's elected to sort of be the chairperson of the Hubble telescope, and they're basically in charge of like yeah this is what we're gonna do this month is what, but they had they're allotted like four hours a month to do whatever they want. Like that's like the weird perk that comes with this job is you can just point the world's most powerful telescope anywhere you want in the world or in the in the universe and just just to fuck around you know like and I don't remember I think it the woman who was in charge at the time uh, I'm not remembering all the, the the information correctly the names but basically she she was just like let's just point it here like it was a dark space that nobody had really looked at. And they just started taking photos. And as the photos developed, what they saw was once you filtered out all the this ambient light or whatever was like this. They call it the Hubble Deep Field, and it is like billions of other galaxies that are like spiral shape, elliptical, circle, like weird hybrid thing, like just billions. And it was like just a random spot in the sky that this person just decided to be like, let's just see what's over here. And it sort of like blew open the idea that we're, I don't think anybody in NASA thought we were alone by any means, but it's just sort of the scale of it all. Like Google deep, Hubble deep field. It's nuts. And just like a total random pointing at the sky, but this idea of chaos that you're talking about in, in space and all that stuff is really interesting to me because I, I think about that all the time in my own, in terms of my own personal, like, right. Place. There's such a parallel there. That's like, that's exactly what I thought about like when I first heard about these galaxies. Because I didn't know anything about galaxies. I didn't know, oh, they're spiral and elliptical. And then what was the other one? I forgot what the third type. Yeah. But there's like three broad, and I'm sure it gets yeah. more specific. It, I, I'm not sure. I know it gets more specific. Well, and then what happens? But like, yeah, I'm with you on that because I think about like how it relates to our lives. And, like, and the inevitable, like, so like the Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy is our nearest galaxy to us, the Andromeda Galaxy. And in like 1.2 billion years, our two galaxies are going to merge and form a bigger, massive galaxy. And like, you can also look, they've like done these timescale things of like what happens to every planet once it merges and like 
once you get within the other orbits of uh, like our solar system all of a sudden becomes way more messy and so possibly just splayed out of, of, around the universe because another galaxy just merges with ours it's going to happen not in our lifetime and not you know but it's just right, kind of it's yeah. like no matter how much not to put like any sort of fatalism on your project but like no matter how awesome your project turns out doesn't matter 1.2 billion years this is all going to be under ice and <laughs> spiraling off no, into I the, love ga- it. it's, in, that into the kind galaxy of thinking can be very negative and it can be very empowering as well like and then you stop worrying about i played a wrong note or that bar was out of time or whatever yeah um, because you just you know have this bigger picture in mind and yeah I well, like thinking about this stuff. Well, let me ask you, like, what, for you with this project, I mean, this project strikes me as something for you personally that felt like you, at least since I last spoke to you, sort of, uh, I was workshopping, workshopping a project, a new project last week with a friend of mine, Ain Gordon, and we, you know, it's like the, the process of making something from scratch can be agonizing and you can walk out after a week feeling like you didn't do anything and Ain looked at me and he's just like well what we did is we broke through the first wall of like what this thing might be and so now we know what the rubble is and we know what we need to rebuild something we don't need all that old rubble we just need this particular chunk that we knocked down and we need to rebuild that and it's like oh okay for you with this project like it feels like you sort of climbed a mountain in some weird way that like uh reaffirmed something that you weren't sure of six months ago when we spoke and I like, am I anywhere? Am I close here? Like, can you talk a little bit about like, Um, am I perceiving something correctly? You're getting into like, you're getting a little bit into mental health is how I'm interpreting this. I might be. Well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it's definitely something I want to talk with you about just because I appreciate your, your vulnerability on that topic. But, but Mm -hmm. I, I I don't want to jump there too quick, but I, I'm just curious for you, like my perception of this project being something for you in this, in this particular moment in time was like, yeah all right i finally i did it i did it like is that is my perception accurate roughly yeah there's i think there's a lot of things that this is for me i mean okay so this was in the works since like september 2019 and by in the works i mean in september 2019 i talked to she i was like hey what how do you feel about this idea of maybe doing this thing and then i talked to james of how do you feel about this idea of maybe writing the music for this thing Mm -hmm. and then it you know was and then so it was all very 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 idea and i was like okay we want these people we want this guitarist we want this other percussionist on it Mm -hmm. and then it was kind of like yeah this will be fun and then we like made a facebook group and then you know months went by and then she got a commission from a museum and so it's like okay we're actually going to do this and so that was where it kind of went process wise um so that's so it's been a long time and so i'm just really excited and happy that it's happening i think another so step one step two i think it's big right now because i'm busy and i haven't Mm. been busy for months and i'm just so happy and comfortable being busy like it's just yeah i don't know i mean like i can meditate for hours and hours and hours and do whatever i need to do but like there's something about just having like being a part of something and accountability and just Mm. like having this and i'm teaching and i I got like two more part-time jobs teaching as well Mm. And so, like, just all of that coming together, like, makes me feel like I'm serving society better than I was a few months ago. And it makes me feel like I'm a part of something. And, mm-hmm. you know, I'm account- the accountability, like I already said, I'm repeating myself. Um, so that's been huge for me. And so I think that's maybe what you're seeing right now. Um, I also feel very responsible for this because I'm the, like, administrative coordinator mm-hmm. or director, whatever mm-hmm. you want to call it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, like, and so to the point where I've we i recorded remotely in la and then everyone else recorded in the uk so there's four musicians Mm -hmm. and the other three recorded together um and so we were in la and then i had to like make certain calls because there was communication that was happening or not happening and i'm okay we're just gonna do this right so it's like i've had quite a bit of um i've been the person organizing the meetings i've been Mm -hmm. like coordinating all the communication across seas or like organizing things like we were supposed to be on a festival in south africa Mm -hmm. um that didn't work because of the lockdown and we couldn't do the project because of the lockdown. So we couldn't be in that festival. Um, so I do feel a lot of ownership, like authority over this project. What for, uh, and for I the... think we all do, but 
Yeah, I mean, well, for you with this project, what were some of, just for, for younger folks who, and remind me, how, how old are you, Gloria? 25. Yeah, okay, so, I mean, I'm only 41. I'm not, like, I don't want to imply that I'm some old, like, wizard in a cave or something but like for yeah. but for you you're 25 there are younger folks below you who are dealing with the same sort of like things that you're dealing with on some level like what what did you learn by sort of being the person at the helm of this project in terms of the organizational stuff like in terms of how the sausage is made about like what's somebody uh, what advice would you give to somebody should i just who, tell you about the mistakes we made yeah <laughs> no i mean that's way to do that. well yeah no i mean that's um, that's what i'm asking is like for somebody who looks at this and is like oh gloria made a project i want to do what gloria is doing what's some like what are some red flags you might have for some folks what are what did you learn from that process rather than just being like a musician playing with other folks like actually being in charge of something yeah it's tough um because the like the majority of the team are just my close friends so any like like any little slip ups or anything we're just fine because we're all just mm. cool with each other mm -hmm. um i think so this i mean this is a specific and unique type of thing because so the, the people I recorded with in LA are in the film industry. They're like Hollywood people. Mm, and so mm. they were really surprised by the way we worked because they were like, well, we have to have time codes and we have to have every single bar in the Pro Tool session. And then that wasn't what we were doing. Mm, um, mm -hmm. It was a lot more fluid and like not as, like it didn't have to be as prescribed. And it, it, so not as much the business of perfection, more the business of, art um, which is difficult when you're dealing across the globe like you, the more specific you can get the easier it's going to be to put together to mix together etc mm -hmm. um but that's you know somewhat what it ended up being and somewhat not um uh so okay so what makes this different and specific and i don't know if this helps or does not help somebody mm -hmm. is we did the music first and then the animator i mean the story was first but then the music was written and then the animator got midi files and she worked with those to kind of, for timings like so mm -hmm. some of the mm -hmm. it, so it's improvised and composed so there were parts where the composer was like okay minute and a half at the beginning free improv she doesn't know what that's going to sound like but she knows that it's in a minute and a half and so mm -hmm. she mm -hmm. does what she does and bases her work off of that so it was a little bit um scattered in that way because the hollywood people they're like oh we have the visuals first and then we write scores to mm -hmm. that but that the purpose of the score has a different um it's a different purpose in mm -hmm. that project in that work because the score is like under text and it's just serving whatever else is happening in the film whereas here the music is kind of it's 50 50 i don't know it's probably like 55 animation 45 music but the music is telling the story it's doing the work like where the actors because we all record and we're all going to be on the film for the most part a couple there's like the uh, just the couple times i've been in the room for soundtrack stuff it's not i mean so's done a few there's a movie or a, a hbo special called the jinx that uh, is about mm -hmm. this guy robert durst who is a, ser a serial killer and um we did some music for it and yeah i mean it's very much like the music again it's just a different it's like of the loaf of bread that is the music world it's like one of those slices is hollywood and yeah. that means that your job as the musician is to never get in the way of the text <laughs> you know never you know you're creating a mood and that's okay i mean it's, there's no value judgment there some people really enjoy that role and there's composers who just like oh wow like they know how to work in that world. I think I'm agreeing with you, or not agreeing with you, I'm sympathizing with you, that the other way, which is messier sometimes, is, like, there's, it's hard to have a formula for, because you don't always know, you don't always know. And in There's Holly a lot of beauty in it, for sure, like, in all the mistakes that you'll hear, et cetera. Yeah. And um, but yeah, and then that was kind of something I learned, is I'm like, oh, wait, I haven't done this, like, I mean, I've done recordings before, but it's always been, like, percussion graded hits like recordings for mm -hmm. competition entries that kind of thing mm -hmm. um but not like play to a click track like uh, there were points where i was like oh i'm just gonna play 
really soft so i play the right notes like because then you can just mix it later Mm -hmm. um that was just like just keep my as in keep my mallets down keep them close to the instrument Mm -hmm. because that's more important than anything else but then there are other parts where i could let go and just be free um and i think that's a skill like apparently people have been in studios and recording studios in hollywood they said they were surprised by how quietly everyone played just because it's like really about perfection Mm -hmm. right and a lot of things can be done in post Um, right right well, and I think it's done texturally in the composition already. Like it's inherently in there. Yeah, I imagine a lot yeah, of it too. I I'm speaking for an industry that I know very little about. I don't think I don't think you're too far off. I mean, I imagine too, like if the stuff is being recorded in a room, um, you know, dealing with cl- dealing with uh, bleed from other mics, like being able to have a mic close. I know. I mean, I listen. I a couple sound engineers I work with are always like, um, record at a low volume so that you can you can always boost it later you know you can you know record a very high quality sound at a low volume and then use you know and those just little tips like that you know it helps i think it's just some of the things that like they don't teach you at i didn't take that class at yale they didn't talk about recording low volume and what is gain structure and like all of those things like no one ever told and 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 i wish that might have been the most useful class i could have had at yale which was you know here's how to use a mixer (laughs) <laughs> you know nobody taught me that i wish i i mean right. I, that's it's something like, we kind of teach ourselves isn't it yeah well let, let me let me ask you Gloria. i mean one of the th- i i don't want to like talk to you because you're the you know only uh use this time to talk to you about mental health but um i also appreciate that you're willing to talk about it and, and you you said in, in in our chats prior that you had some more insights since the last time we spoke and i'm curious if there's if you've like where's your head been at um in the last six months since we spoke, has it been six months? Something like that. Yeah, like what? Know. How has is your? Anyone keeping track of time? Uh, it's March three hundred and seventy fifth, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, right. Yeah. I know I personally have had some sort of. I go in waves, but I'm curious for you, like where? How how have you been thinking about that stuff since last we spoke? I feel I feel like the last thing is unfinished, so I want to go back and mm-hmm. then I'll come. To oh yeah, yeah, this. please, please. Um, but I'm trying to remember why, because now you have me thinking about Sorry. a new topic, so maybe I'll forget. And that's totally fine. That's totally fine. But I just, I felt like there was something. Oh, yes, there was something. So working with visuals and with music, mm-hmm. I, the, the R&D, like the research and development side of it, mm-hmm. I wish we had spent a lot more time on. And I think that's, I mean, that's limited by our budget, but I wish like, we had, you know, because the animator didn't have recordings of our improvisations until this week, right? Mm-hmm. So she mm-hmm. didn't know what that was going to sound like. And now there's like cymbal goings and guitar distortions and like crazy, like just sounds for a minute and a half. And I don't know how it's going to work. And so that's something that I'm like, oh, I wish we could do this differently. And But the other thing is like, we don't get paid, right, to do. <laughs> so that's the bit that's like, you have to invest that time yourself and like you wish you had a generous donor or something to do it i mean we we will get paid a little bit with this kickstarter we included some artist fees for like the recording sessions Mm -hmm. but it's yeah i i I guess the to conclude it it's the figure it out yourself but now next topic Um, well just to sort of put a just to like the the thing in my experience too the things that have been the best projects have been the things that have been the poorly most poorly funded like sometimes, not every time. To be clear, I don't want to be disingenuous. Yeah. Having funding is yeah, great yeah. when you when you when you have it and you need it. But sometimes having a, like a gun held to your head of like you have to make a decision. Like there's research that goes that that says like you make better decisions in meetings if you, if everybody has to pee. Yeah. Because okay. like you don't you don't have a you're not sitting there like playing out every scenario and then playing devil's advocate. And sometimes that's mm-hmm. good, but it, sometimes in an artistic setting. Being like, I'm going to write a piece in one hour. And when right. it's done, it's going on the internet. Like, uh-oh. Like, I'm with you. Yeah, because there's an, an intuition there. And then you just, like, you don't have time to overthink it or to analyze it and think about the form and, like, come up with this chord, chord structure and be mm-hmm. like, okay, well, I don't want to put the fifth in the melt. Like, if you don't start thinking technically right you're just going intuitively and that's really yeah good. yeah i'm super with you sometimes there. the r&d yeah. stuff like i think maybe for your next project the thing might be like let's just spend the first month improvising and like we're just gonna record everything put it up 
And then the project is going to be you finding the like four and a half seconds of each improv that you actually like. <laughs> and then yeah. being like, okay, cool. Like there's a band called Buke and Gaze that we, that so just a, an album with um, Aaron Dyer and Aaron Sanchez. And they, they rehearse. That's how they write their albums. Like they'll just improvise for four hours and then be like that one lick you played at hour two. Let's transcribe cool. that and use that. So Anyway, just to, I think your, your process is really interesting. It's I've, different with animation because she has to prepare everything. That's right. where it's like, the, there's a language barrier. She can't yeah. read music. She can't read a score. So it like becomes a really different thing. That's but true. yeah, I, I love it. Um, yeah, and I've, I've had like some pieces that I've composed faster went better than the ones that I spent a lot of time on. Like mm-hmm. I'm not as happy with those that I, I was just tweaking and tweaking. And it's like some, like I just had the idea idea just improvise and i'm like okay this this sounds good write it down <laughs> next like keep going with that I, w- yeah. I was in school with an architect and he was like you think you have it bad he's like when when is a building done that's a great question like when are you done when do you as the architect be like okay this co- like you can change everything when people start using it i guess uh, maybe but mm-hmm. like it like or when do you sign off and be like okay foreman here's the blueprint like there's always some corner you can make more structurally sound there's always some little sconce you can put that hat does the sconce have that or does it go down like all of those things and he's just like at some point you just gotta you gotta cut your losses and move on otherwise you can go nuts and um but um anyway well the the one of the issues that that you had spoken that you had talked about specifically a couple months ago and we spoke was about like the, the sense of belonging or like knowing your place and the sort of anxieties around that. And I'm just kind of curious. I want to pick your brain a little bit about, about where you sit with that now after a little time has passed. Sense of belonging. I'm going to repeat what you just said. Sense of belonging, knowing your place. Where am I at with that now? Or just like your, your own personal yeah. views on that stuff. Like when I say know your place, not like know your place, Gloria, but like no, 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 knowing, no, no. knowing I, your no, place in the sort interpreting. of no, I, global. I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm just absorbing. Um, I think that I think that I was in a similar place to a lot of people where it's like, what, what's the point? Like music doesn't matter. Um, or like the nothing matters, but there's mm. also two sides of nothing matters. Nothing matters can be a very good thing and it can be a very negative thing. Um, it's both. So I was on the negative side mm. of it. Um, and yeah, I felt very, very disempowered because I was like, I had just moved countries. You know, I was just establishing myself in the city, which was actually going on paper well like I say on paper well because it never felt like even pre-corona it didn't feel that good like I never still never had enough money but somehow it was still slowly getting gigs and then as time passed there were more and more in the calendar in the future so I think that means on paper going well (laughs) like that's what I describe Mm -hmm. as that um and then so yeah all of that disappears and I so I wasn't a part of anything like I wasn't Mm -hmm. a part of an institution um, I didn't have like a super solid friend group. Actually, at that time, I really missed being in England, even though I remember leaving England consciously being like, this is not where I want to live. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I had a great time here, but I like very much knew that that wasn't where I wanted to stay. Um, and then at that point, I was like, I so wish I was in England because I had closer friends there. I, mm-hmm. I was there for two years. Um, and then we were, you know, doing Zoom hangs and it was like, my 11 a.m. their evenings they're all drinking beers and i'm drinking coffee i don't know maybe i drink beers too but um no judgment here i'm listen what happens in quarantine stays in quarantine as far as i'm concerned <laughs> no i'm happy to be public about it and i don't remember what i did but point being it was like yeah it felt very very out of like lack of community that's what it was mm-hmm. um also my my roommate at the time was crazy crazy anxious i hope she doesn't listen to this but if she does, that's okay. It's all like, I mean, I could have been a better roommate too. If she, if she has complaints, go for it. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not roommates anymore. <laughs> but she was like, we have to social distance in our apartment. As in like, we couldn't, mm. like we live together, but we cannot be in the state. Like she had this table and I had this table and like I had the sofa and she had her room and then we couldn't be in the kitchen at the same time. So like if anyone was in the kitchen, you have to wait. Like it was like, to me, that's extreme. 
Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. that's overdoing it just because you're living in the same place. Like you can just use the kitchen. Um, mm-hmm. It was just very, like it was a very, very neurotic approach to the, the entire Corona thing. And then yeah. I, I came here and it was the opposite actually. Like I was the more careful. My parents are, um, they like Trump and that's, I can stop it there. Um, but they're like, you know, they're like having <laughs> yeah. my grandma over um, who got vaccinated. Yay. I'm so good, happy. Good. Glad to hear um, it. But, you know, they were having her before she got vaccinated. And I was, the first time I remember being incredibly uncomfortable with it. And I was like, I just won't even be in the same room as any of you. Mm. Um, Mm. And they had. Because of the Trump thing or because of the coronavirus thing? Because of coronavirus, I think it's irresponsible. Yeah. Um, Because there, you know, there are people who haven't seen their families for months and months and months and months. um, And they're just, that to me felt reckless. But. But at the same time, like I was living in a city where everyone is close together and there's a lot more mixing and a lot mm-hmm. uh, much higher risk. And so like the neuroticism made more sense. It was more appropriate there. Whereas here, everyone's got their houses and their pools and their tennis courts mm-hmm. and like their dogs and you can walk really far away yeah. from each other. And so it's like fewer people have coronavirus in this area. So the risk is lower. Right, um, right. I mean, the, the, uh, everything you're saying, like for me personally, the, the lack I was, I'm just going to come clean. So, and I think I'm still sort of like, if I have to put a finger on the specific trauma that, that I think I'm now able to identify a little bit of why I was so like despondent and like anxious ridden through the Corona or through the quarantine, especially over the summer, like starting in June for me was when it really hit was my, uh, some good friends of our, of my wife and I, um, lost their two year old son to a seizure, like not Corona related, but he had a, just a tragic seizure and passed away. They, you know, couldn't go to the hospital, all this stuff they had a, and this was in June, I believe. Um, or June or end of May, beginning of June. And we, we did like a drive by like service where we drove by, they were sitting in their front yard on a, on a little picnic cloth, just wailing Gloria. Like, I swear to God, it was like you were at, they were just, I've never heard sounds like that come out of a human being, but I had to drive by two of my best friends in their most intense moment of loss. Like then the next week is when George Floyd was murdered. And everybody pours into the streets. Protests are happening. If you're not in the pro, if you're not in the streets, like again, like I'm saying this because I, I I have a lot of friends in the steel band community who are out protesting from Brooklyn, and I'm uh, the part of me was just sort of like, of course I want to, of course, of course. But I just had to, I just had to drive by two of my friends because the medical professionals said I couldn't touch them. And now medical professionals are out there saying racism is a pandemic. So it's okay to protest and be around. And I'm like, I have, I I can hold all of the thoughts in my head that George Floyd was murdered, murdered in broad daylight, but I cannot dis I can't not hear my friends screaming at the top, top of their lungs in my head. And so this, like, for me, I had a real hard time, Gloria, just like, being feeling like I wasn't being supportive of the things I needed to be supportive of because of this trauma personally that I was forced to go through because of this court, you know, because of coronavirus, you know, um, I feel like now I'm, I'm, I can't say that I have a healthier view of it, but I at least can look at it and be like, Oh, that's why I was, that's why I was feeling the way I was. Cause I, I wasn't able to reconcile the way society was treating things. People could die of coronavirus and we all had to stay six feet apart from each other and drive by and not even get out of the car. But when this other thing happens with George Floyd, all of a sudden all the rules go out the window. And I can I totally understand why people are in the streets. I'm on the side, baby. Like, I get it. Yeah. But yeah, for, for me, for me personally, I just, my brain shut down. I had a real hard time with that. And that was like, I don't have, there's no like, grand revelation here Gloria but just like that for me I think was the hardest part being away from people that was that was frustrating you know I love traveling I love being in airports and just watching people and talking to strangers like I miss that 
But in terms of yeah, the like sure. thing I'm talking to with my therapist, it's the like, I should have been in the streets protesting, but I physically and mentally was not able to because of this specific trauma that's on Facebook Live. You can go on Facebook Live and see me standing up in front of my car just waving at my friends like some Black Mirror movie, you know, Black Mirror episode. Um, I don't know. I, that's all I had to say about that, Gloria. But like as it, it, for me, I think now I, being a year out of this or a year in this, that's like the very specific in terms of my own mental health. That's been the thing that I've just real had a real hard time chewing on and figuring out whether or not I, I can't take back. I can't take back that I didn't go in the streets. You know, but and it's, that's something you think about not having gone in the streets. Well, it, yes. There are other things you could do, right? Well, I mean, to, to me, I feel like the thing that I that I do, like activism and support and allyship, all that stuff takes many different forms. You know, like there's there's a million ways to be an ally and to be a friend. And to me, I feel like I'm in it to win it for forty years. And so I have to forgive myself for two months of not knowing what to do or not, or, or maybe knowing what to do, but not being able to do it because of some personal failure on my end, but able to process. Like I couldn't, I couldn't put the experience with Kim and Tara in a separate bucket until recently, you know, like I couldn't d detangle all of those things That's for me, for me personally, to be able to then go out publicly and talk about this stuff and feel like. I can both support my friends Kim and Tara and Black Lives Matter and all my friends who are in the steel band world who I've spent two decades with and science and, and, and you know, and, and wanting to keep people healthy. Like I wasn't even able to talk about that six months ago. Um, and I feel like now, like you're the first person I've actually ever really spoken to specifically about that. And I'm just kind of curious if that, if there's any, if you have, I feel like I'm just using you for my therapy now, Gloria, I apologize, <laughs> but I, I feel like this stuff, I don't, I don't, think I'm the only person maybe who has not had that who's had that specific issue I don't think I'm the only person who for whom detangling many complicated issues during this year has been hard hmm. well first of all thank you I you know thanks for being vulnerable I'm like I'm flattered that you told me I think these things are so hard to say we, we keep them in our heads a while until we're ready to say them mm -hmm. and then you know we're never really ready to say them we just do it at some point and then that <laughs> takes like this little piece off like or, i remember one like, I, I haven't ever had clinical depression but i've definitely had bouts of mm. depressiveness and i remember the first person i told and i was like, like I, I remember i was planning to tell somebody i had a project on i was going to tell these two women that i was working with because i because it I just had a shitty week leading up to that performance and I couldn't prepare as well as I wanted to. And so I was going to tell them, Hey, look, I've been not okay, but I didn't, I couldn't do it. And then I remember when I did tell when actually, do you know Chris size? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. He's like one of my closest. So I told him over a beer and then that was like a huge deal. I was like, Oh my mm -hmm. gosh, I said this out loud. Mm -hmm. um, so I really, you know, uh, appreciate you talking to me openly about that. Um, and I think just what resonated with me w with about that was just this massive confusion that we're going through. Mm -hmm. And I think like we can touch on activism a little bit too, because I'm in my, my toes are in different camps and philosophies right now mm. about this. Um, so I have a few friends who, okay. So recently, I don't know if you were, following any of this there was the marimba fest in australia that got called out for lack of diversity in their mm -hmm. faculty lineup no okay, it's amazing i mean i'm as you're talking about media. this it's amazing to me like you know our world is so small you know the music world is is is, is, is like high school but i still like there's still things that yeah. i am not gonna even in this small world That's I probably just, for the best <laughs> i mean i don't know like I, in general i'm trying to avoid social media sort of like drama in general like i just for my own personal right. anxiety yeah I, so I, that's I, what i'm about to get into okay sorry I go have ahead a lot of thoughts about this and maybe i'm gonna get canceled but <laughs> not by me really gloria if, if they're gonna thoughts. cancel if they're gonna cancel you they're gonna cancel me too so i'll go down with the ship <laughs> <laughs> um and then so but how about malatech lee hard stevens seminar i saw um, something that 
again, it was I saw something go by, but I it, I'm trying real hard to actively not not engage with comment threads if I can avoid it. If it reaches the level of if I hear about it more than like two or three times, then I'll engage with it. But just I saw it once and I was like, I I, I was like, it's 858 and I have a meeting in two minutes. I can't go down this rabbit hole right right now, you know. Well, that's good. You know, that's what I mean. Like when you're busy, you're not worried about these like minutiae, you know, you just get caught up in these emotions of things that don't actually affect you in your life, which is fine because you care and you're like being a sensitive person. I think that's something we're um, similar on. But yeah, I, su I agree with you on that. I mean, like I, I get caught up in feeling like uh, what was I what was I caught up in? A few days ago, I was just I was just listening to so much news and just like hearing about the injustice, like how basically colored people can't get access to the vaccine because mm -hmm. the insurances that they're on like are not giving them, um, providing them good mm -hmm. enough resources. And I was just like, just my heart broke and like, it, it was just a tragedy. I'm like, how am I supposed to like go through my day when this like fucking America is just in shambles? Like this is like supposed to be one of the greatest countries on earth, and we're we're not even getting we're getting the vaccine to rich white folks it's like this is well and there's disastrous. some of the stuff too like around <laughs> vaccine hesitancy i mean i work in the caribbean community a fair amount and you know i again this is the thing that's so confusing sometimes is like right. i hear a lot of conspiracy theories from my friends in the pan world and i see it on i mean okay. just in terms of things that go by on facebook like I, I'm, yeah, Caribbean, uh, Jamaica, Trinidad, yeah, Jamaica, Trin all like, of it. Yeah, I'm, I I try to be careful when I say like like the steel band community because it's it's there's a bigger diaspora of of Caribbean right. population, different cultures. Like it's way messy. I can't just say it's Trinidadian because that's they make up a big part of it. But there's different a, there's okay. Haitians, there's Dominican Republic, there's Barbadians, like Grenadians. Cool. For me, that when I say Caribbean community, I'm sort of just talking about at least the, the the swath that I intersect with. And I see on Facebook a lot of conspiracy theories about Bill Gates and the microchip and all this stuff. And oh, yeah. that was hilarious. it can get lumped in with the same sort of conspiratorial thinking you hear on the far right politically about Stop the Steal or QAnon or all this stuff. And it does kind of get all lumped in. But it's been interesting, like to talk to some of my friends and, and you learn why are they afraid of the vaccine or why is there hesitancy? Well, look at the Tuskegee Airmen, look at the way medical profession has over the hundreds of years of human existence, at least in the United States, we tried stuff out on them. Hmm. Like the Tuskegee, I don't, I think the Tuskegee thing was about a cure for syphilis and like they, they purposefully infected people as a way of, trying to figure out how this stuff works. And so in the black community there, or at least in the Caribbean community that I have been a part of, there's a sort of a more, there's a, there's a skepticism of science. And to me, it's just like, those are the things that like, when we talk about diversity and we talk about all of these things, it's like, well, yes, th there's a lot of hesitancy too. There's a lot of, yes, there's a lot of structural reasons why the vaccine isn't making it to some of these communities. But when it does, there's also this, trauma that also needs to be disentangled with information yeah. and anyway just to i mean to interrupt you but like that, yeah, I didn't know about that it's interesting when you learn about why these hesitancies exist it's usually because there's some good reason whether or not that reason is rational now in 2021 i don't think bill gates is putting my, I, I think i can stand here and be like i'm pretty sure i don't have a microchip in me <laughs> you know like i actually i want to he just, um, he wrote a new book about climate change. I don't know if you heard about that. I've heard. Is this the um, one where he's going to block out the sun or something? That's a broad brush to paint with. No. But, okay. <laughs> no, um, I don't. I, I went to a talk with him and Trevor Noah, like a live mm. stream. And then that, so uh, the book's in the mail to me. So it's coming at some point. Um, and it was interesting because that was the first question that Trevor Noah asked was like, wait, why? climate change like you haven't been dealing i mean he's probably touched on it but this hasn't been your like he wrote a book on it which mm -hmm. is a big step from like oh this is a concern to mm -hmm. i'm gonna study this and go into it and actually publicize and try and get everybody on board with what i think and feel about this um in that talk he addressed the microchip thing and he was like what kind of 
motivation would I have to do this? And then so Trevor Noah was like, oh, maybe it's like the tracking everybody. And he's like, I can't even keep track of myself. Like, I don't care where everybody is. Um, but it was just how, how he addressed it was quite funny. Yeah. Um, well, how do you address something that's yeah. just so patently insane? Like the idea that Bill Gates... Yeah. Okay. So like you can't, somebody wouldn't tweet that out. Somebody wouldn't leak like the amount of people that would have to be sort of sworn to secrecy to have that sort of conspiracy actually flush out and be true and have no, like it's the people who say like nine 11 was an inside job. I'm like, do you know, like Donald Trump couldn't keep his like interns from tweeting out what he said in the, in the oval office. Like, do you honestly believe that that's there's the not thing that amazes one person me about QAnon, like that he's the savior that's going to fix all, you know, yeah, the, it's... the youth serum that all the Hollywood celebrities are grabbing. And like, it's like Trump is the Messiah. And it's like, have you kept, like, have you paid attention to anything he's done? Like, he's just a mess. Like he doesn't, he can't, like he can't even keep track of himself. Like well, it's kind of the, the same thing. And it's like, how is he going to come and save everybody from this chaos that doesn't exist? But if, if you believe it exists, you know, well, how is he going to do that? If you like pay attention to anything he's done over the last. And not to tie it back into your project, but like the it's, I think sometimes with conspiracy theories, people like chaos is terrifying. Like true mm -hmm. chaos is terrifying. I did a podcast with uh, Gilles and Joyce Rousseau. What do you mean by true chaos? Uh, the, what I mean by it is this. So, like, I did a podcast with Jill and uh, Joyce, Joyce and Gilles Rousseau, whose daughter Lauren Rousseau was killed in Sandy Hook. She was she was one of the two teachers who was killed. And the idea that I'm not abdicating Alex Jones at all. I think he is an, he he is a succubus on society who is just sucking out the marrow of all of us. But for people who follow him. And, you know, people, they, they, they made conspiracies that all of the kids were crisis actors. Gilles and Joyce Rousseau have, like, death threats out against them because they are, people think they were hired by Obama to further gun legislation. Now, yes, those are all crazy. But what's scarier to those people, what's crazier is the idea that somebody could just randomly wake up, walk into a school and kill 26 people. That's terrifying. Like, there's no sense to be made with that. How do you... That's like telling me telling you that the Andromeda Galaxy is going to run into the Milky Way. That's insane. Like, right. like, so you mean to tell me there's no stopping that? So by true chaos, you mean the negative implication. Yes, the negative that. implication, which is that, like, you don't actually have control. Like, Adam Lanza was somebody who was a product of decisions made for him and by him since he was birth since birth. This was, wasn't something that somebody could. I don't could... know Adam Lanza, but this sounds a lot like Britney Spears. Adam Lanza was the shooter from Sandy Hook. Um, he, okay. he was the kid who, who, Sorry. no, that's okay. No, I, that's okay. I didn't know his name. Um, he, um, the idea that he, it makes more sense to people that he would be hired by the government. Like that's like, Oh, okay. All right. Well that, that makes sense. Like that I can deal so how with. How are decisions made for him and was, was he mentally ill? Was that well, it's just like he was on the spectrum. He was given guns as, as a youth, um, as a way of bonding with his family. Like that was the thing that they could do together. Like a hobby? Yeah, okay. like a hobby. And um, he was a recluse, like in his room. Like just there's there's a series. The institutions weren't taking care of him. There was a lot of things in place that were right. happening. Like that is a chaotic, when we talk about systems, you know, like systems are scary and it doesn't because there's so many things that go into what shoots somebody out the other side and makes Gloria Gloria makes Josh Josh and makes Adam Lanza Adam Lanza and so for somebody to concoct a like oh well if if Obama just did this in the in the Oval Office like that okay well that makes more sense you know than this idea that there might be this lone wolf and anyway okay. just to say that like I empathize with conspiracy theorists because there's a tiny part of me that's like I can't you can't, some people might not be able to function if they think that at any moment somebody could just walk in. It would have to be a government conspiracy. That's like, it's a weird way of coping. Um, yeah. And it's well, just... it's easier, right? Because the, yes. the hard thing is imagining or thinking about what it actually is, which could make you very uncomfortable. Um, right. And that's, you know, who wants to sit and be uncomfortable with what happened to them or why it happened to them or why the world is the way it is like we just want to explain things and right. so if you can find a way to do that and convince yourself of that 
then in some ways you're empowered, you know, then you just go through the rest of your day and I'm, yeah, I'm with you. Um, well, you had, I don't wish any, like, yeah, I, I, I haven't actually thought about this because I haven't thought about sympathizing or not sympathizing about conspiracy theories. I've only thought about the theories themselves and debunking them, mm -hmm. but I haven't thought about the people specifically. Um, well, we all have like, what's our reasoning? I mean, why do you believe what you believe? Like there's, you know, there's things, you know, you believe what you lots believe. Of reasons. Yeah. For lots of reasons. And then there's things yeah. that I don't believe because I've been exposed to things that countered that previous belief. And those things take even things that feel like, like, I would like to think that I'm not a racist person, but I was in New York last week. It was late at night and I was walking home and I had feelings that I shouldn't have mm. about. Well, that's <laughs> what we're sitting with right? You know? these days. It's like this, I mean, basically this awakening that we all need to be going through. It's like, um, no, neither you or I are overtly racist, but we were born in this country and like, basically we were born racists, right? And like, we just have to be able to be like okay yes i am a racist like in, in one way or another you know i've been subscribing or contributing to the system um and then what am i going to do about that and that's kind of a hard thing it's like because even if you don't feel racist or are you frozen no you're just listening sorry i'm, I'm listening <laughs> sorry i'll move more go ahead keep talking <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> i'm here Gloria. it's all good no for a second i did think you were because you were very stuff i need to then you blinked um, <laughs> blank blank Blinked. Blank. 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 Blinked. Blank. Blinked. Blinked. You blank. Blinked. Uh, um, we'll circle back to that one. <laughs> like we are, you know, we are all some form of racist. Like I really think, I what did I do? The um, I have I have an example. Uh, oh, maybe I'll come back to it. But I have an example of me being racist recently that I had to like debunk, and I had to be like, oh hey, you're doing this thing. Like you're thinking of. It was just some version of thinking of a colored person, of a brown skinned person, as mm. a lesser. Um, well, there's the in some way, and like not intent. You know, it was yeah. just like the formulas that are in my bottle. However, the neurons are firing just went, you know, and just put this bias into whatever I was thinking. Oh, I wish I could be more specific. Well, no, I mean, the, that would be helpful. But for me, the issue is the, the thing. For me, the issue is like, yeah, I had that feeling walking down an alley late at night in New York. I wasn't bummed that I, like I reacted the same way to that feeling that I feel like I've always reacted to, which is like, that's a dumb feeling. Just keep walking. It's fine. Like this is a person, right. you know? And it's more of the, just like, it is fascinating to me that my brain, despite all of the experiences <laughs> I've had spending late nights in pan yards, like walking home late at night, being with like, my brain still has that, wiring and i still have to be like hey you silly goose you're 41 now you don't have to you don't have to do that anymore you know um and it to me it's just an interesting thing to track like is it ever going to go away is it just going to show up somewhere else like and then can i recognize it when it comes up enough so that i can sort of divert those actions around it and not not act on that and that to me, the issue around some, like how we talk about this stuff has like, like I grew up in a small rural town um, where the words white supremacy and racist meant something specific. Like there was a guy who wore a hood in town to scare the black people that moved in. Mm -hmm. That's a racist. At least it, when I was growing up, that was somebody like, that's a specific like first, second, th third degree murder, that was premeditated murder, right? And then there's a version of racism, which is the more subtle infesting kind, which is, in, you know, in, in the way we run organizations and all of those sorts of things. To me, I, I, as a 41 year old, I think for me, the issue has been around, like, we need a new word for it, because, or we need oh, to come up with different good. branding or something for what somebody is. Because to me, when I hear racist, I see that guy with a hood. And I can't, I can't, like, like he's a racist. My mom yeah. might have more complicated views on things, but she's not that guy. Right. So how do, and, and I think sometimes that language can alienate people and be like, well, if you're going to call me that guy, 
I don't even want to interface with you. Like, right. You well, know, that, and that's where it becomes, this goes into white fragility a little bit. And it's like, we, you know, we can all just be conscious of enough of like whatever slightly racist tendencies I do have, which actually, I mean, if it helps, cause I, I will talk to one of my best friends, he's black, um, African American. And so I'll talk about this and I'm like, wait, am I in, in some sort of interaction? Like, am I motivated? Or am I thinking about this differently because this person's black? And he's like, no, I don't think it's that. Mm -hmm. And so when he says that, that helps. But it's but none of this is about me being like appraised or validated by, mm -hmm. <laughs> like that's not what any of this is about. Um, but it's what it's become is we we're on this massive spectrum of mm -hmm. what racism can be or what it means or what it is. And so when you're you know on the much much less extreme side of that spectrum it's hard to reckon with that and I, I think that that's a great idea is we, we need a different word I think we should also ask BIPOC um black indigenous and people of color what they think about mm -hmm. whether we should have a new word for this or not well um, yeah I mean it's the ones who would, yeah I would defer to them well yeah I mean there's it's just an interesting to me it's just an interesting thing I mean I think we are we're a society who's who is placing a lot of importance on words right now right like the word BIPOC right. is a new word and that's right. like it's going to be in the di Google is a relatively new word I mean we 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 come up with terms to meet the needs of the day and that's important um, the issue around, and I don't even want to say it's an issue because it's something that we should just get better at, like, but gender pronouns for me as a teacher, I, Gloria, I fell on my face in front of students so many times calling she, he, they like miss, <laughs> mislabeling, saying the wrong thing. Like it took me a lot of work, like the, they, them thing hmm. down to clown. But for 41 years, that was plural. And I just, for me to look at one person and say they, it wasn't, my intent was not at all like to hurt somebody. But I had to stop and be like, they. <laughs> like I had to say it out loud slowly and practice it because in my routine, I'm a guy who's just like, boom, boom, boom. Like, I, you know, I have like, I move quick. And I had to stop and slow down because I didn't want to offend anybody. But it's because there's a there's an importance on words right now and the r word racism is like that's a word that is getting used a lot to apply to when we see anything that's happening and i feel like i don't have an answer i don't know what the word is but like is it neo racism is it so, something else that is like can, so that we can better drill down on this because i do feel like i worry that if i have little sentiments of alienation in these conversations then certainly people from my hometown are going to be like anti-racism. What? Like, I don't know what you're yeah. talking about, you know? And that doesn't mean they're bad people. It just is like this language is moving so quickly. And like you mentioned the cancel culture thing a second ago about around the discussions in some of yeah. the, the percussion yeah, field. Back to yeah. And I'm just kind of curious what, what you were thinking about with those particular issues. And like I said, I'm, I'm not super hip to what's going on in those. Yeah. Uh, so I have a few friends who are, quite, in my opinion, very, very far left in mm -hmm. terms of, like, it's okay to suppress white men for the next 150 years. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I am not as um, adamant on that. Sometimes I am. Some days I'm like, the, the other, actually, I spoke with a, a friend the other day, and I was like, look, I just don't want to date white guys anymore. Like, um, just, but that's for me, that's a cultural thing. It's, it's, that doesn't mean that there aren't white guys who are sensitive and like very respectful, but it's just like, there's, it's so likely, it's so common to find somebody who is just arrogant and just like this classic, like American, like just got everything easy, um, is not interested in anything that's beyond you know their like circle or like making money or whatever it is that they think so like because this is what you see on dating apps like so many of them just look the same and they're all like investment bankers and i'm just like not super super not interested and so that you know and i, I just told a friend about that i'm like wait is this you know 
is this wrong? I told a few friends about that. Mm-hmm. Like, is this wrong of me to just be like, I'm just not going to date white guys. Um, and then, so in some ways, yes, because there are exceptions. Like I could find somebody who I really get along with and vibe with and who is mm-hmm. like a, Chris size is a perfect example of this. Like he and I are very close mm-hmm. friends and he is not at all like this stereotypical person I'm describing. Um, but then the so i guess the argument that's made for what i'm saying is that yes there are exceptions to this but i'm much much more likely to find this type of person amongst white guys than i am amongst anybody from any other cultural background Mm. Um, but that's to say i mean i like i dated whatever you want to call it um somebody who was hair heritage wise mexican but Mm -hmm. culturally extremely extremely american Mm -hmm. um And that's like, I am American and I'm saying this as an American, but that's something that I, I do find unattractive um, Mm. just because I've traveled a lot. My parents are Russian. um, And so I've grown up with a lot of different cultural influences. I I also lived in Belgium for five years growing up. I did a master's in England. And so I've been exposed to a lot of different, you know, types of sense. I I just don't like the, it's the arrogance Mm. that really, really bothers me. Um, what can I ask you? The, you mentioned yeah. dating apps. That that too is something I feel like generally generationally is something I. I mean, not there are people in my generation so used weird. To dating apps, but like no, I, so I asked my wife out, my 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 would be wife out on our first date by sending my friend Adam Wells to ask her if she was into me. Like I was twenty two years old, Gloria. I was in college, and I was like, "Can you go see if she likes me?" Like. That yeah, was yeah, yeah. that was my dating app. Like I was super shy and nervous. I, I, I it's interesting because I'm like we're awkward now, but I was like, oh, the last generation wasn't as awkward as we are. But you just you debunked that for me. We yeah. are. I'm only a 41 year old version of you, Gloria. I mean, yes, I'm a man and like a, a white, all those things. But like I, I was 25 too, and but I, I often wonder like, would I have been more comfortable with asking women out if I had dating apps? if it had made it easier for me to interface on the other hand um it's so i think it's so personal because actually like this is so i i, I think i had a profile on one and i never used it like i never got on it until i was spending more time with this friend in la who mm-hmm. did, was the recording engineer for this project and he was on all of them and he's like one of my best friends mm-hmm. and so he just destigmatized it for me that's what it was because okay. he was talking about it and i'm like you know what if you're on it like you're amazing like you're one of my favorite humans surely i'm gonna find a great human on here um so he destigmatized it for me and then i started using it a little bit and it's it's interesting because i so i did start seeing somebody and i had a lot of anxiety around that just because i didn't know i liked this person like i was very attracted to this person still am um but there was there were so many like unknowns about Mm. who this person is he's I'll tell you about him. I don't, know, I don't know if I should. I don't know how long it's, it's going to last. But he's so he's Haitian, mm-hmm. um, different culture. Like he has an accent. He lived in Haiti until he was fifteen. Mm-hmm. Um, I also I haven't dated anyone who was black. So he thinks about a lot of things. He's like he he talked about just I won't get into speci- specifics of that. But he said you know he's like oh I think about this I think about this and I'm like I've never had to think about this. He's like yeah because you're white you haven't had to think about this. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's been a huge learning experience for me and where am I going with this so for me the the anxiety part of it was not um insecurity with myself the anxiety part of it was I don't know enough about this person Mm -hmm. and so it's Mm -hmm. like this person's a stranger to me who I'm also attracted to and whenever we're around each other everything's great but whenever I'm away I get in my head and I can't go to sleep and I can't get up because I'm just like, what if this, what if this, what if this happens? What if this? And so my brain just goes in these crazy, crazy directions. Um, well, talk about conspiracy theories. Well, like glory. maybe it was going that far. Well, I, like at, at one point I had to just sit, like I was like really emotionally charged. I just had to sit with myself for half an hour and just calm myself down. Like think about like, okay, what, what happened versus what is happening in my head? Like what stories am I telling myself in my head? Right. What um, your feelings, your feelings are not proof of anything. They're just right. proof of how you feel. Thoughts. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I don't want to debunk the, I, I, the... Everything you're describing may just sound like you like this person. Yeah. yeah, yeah like, like that may just be like that's <laughs> Sounds I'm like... I'm sure just, of that now. It's been long enough, but at the beginning... It was I, really 
I mean, I'm still smitten with my wife. I still think she's the most attractive person in the world. But our, our the first part of our relationship, we first started dating, like I went to Trinidad for a month right after, you know, two months into our relationship. And then she did a church camp over the summer. And so she would go away for like three months. There weren't, we didn't have cell phones. This was in 2002. So no cell phones, no email. Um, sh- there was one landline on the property where she was working that I could talk to her like once a month. So we wrote letters. She wrote a, she wrote a letter and she's like, oh, I'm really having a great time at camp. There's this Australian foreign exchange student named Ewan and his accent is amazing. Can't oh, wait. Oh, did to- you get jealous? And I was like, I am going to. I hate. I still hate Australians to like Australian accents today. For some reason, I have this oh just like God. no, and it's because of you. And it's not because I have any genuine hatred or anything of Australians, but That's I think hilarious. it's because. And for for a month, Gloria, I I was just like I gotta I, I gotta work out. Like I went and I lifted weights. I went running every day because I was just like but this is, is good. Yeah. Is she on a hike with Ewan? Is she like in a sleeping bag with you? Like all of the. I'm just like, what the fuck is wrong? Now I'm married to her and we've been together for twenty some odd years, but. Anyway, Good. point being, it Good. sounds to me like you're smitten with this band, and that's okay. That all sounds totally normal, <laughs> Normal what you're describing. Um, no, I like him a lot. Um, but but those were the kind of anxiety. But it was like genuine anxieties and fears going mm-hmm. through my head just because mm-hmm. I didn't know him that well yeah. at the very beginning. Um, and still don't know him that well, but that, more comfortable with it. And, but so what do you do when you're, you know, going through this, you, you Google it. Right. So I went and like looked for, you know, like, is there anybody I can, like, are there any psych, um, articles in psychology today about what happened? But all of the articles were very much about, um, dealing with rejection, which is very important. And they were about like people basically people spending a lot of time on the dating apps and Mm -hmm. being unsure of like what like much more um insecurity based and so so i couldn't quite relate with what was being put out so i just didn't get and so i think this whole so i think the moral of the story is the whole experience is very very personal Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. and so all of those articles are very very like generic and it's going to be a different experience for everybody so so people are going to get on these apps and just get rejected over and over again Mm -hmm. and that's gonna really really fuck with people's heads and so that's a negative side of this you know like because now your your value kind of becomes it's a lot more superficial because how do you judge this person in the first place because of how they look like right there's it's a little bit the like hiding that (laughs) we we as a society loathe the idea that facebook was started as a like is she who's hotter app like that's what it was it was two women from the from harvard that would just get like warm and you could just pick which one was hotter right and now facebook is what it is now and, and maybe perhaps destroying democracy it really it really came a long way in 14 years but like um tinder is the same thing except like you the the anxiety difference is though like you're swiping left or right you're sort of being like this person's appropriate this person's not except there's subconsciously you know people are doing that with you and like somebody has swiped left four times on you and then some uh, people have swiped well, I don't even know what those two mean <laughs> swiping left or right but like I forgot which there's this built in like you know that people are seeing your stuff and then are sw- are saying you're not appropriate and like that doesn't happen as quickly in the real world like when you're just interfacing with somebody whenever i say to my wife hey i think you're attractive would you like to go out sometime like that interaction is has to be slightly but she can't just be like swipe left you know and move on with her day as if it never happened you know and I'm anyway, I'm just you're highlighting some things in our psychology that I think is important that we don't ignore because I think it is creating a lot of anxiety. Like, um, yeah, I think it's multi, I think it's, I think it's great because like I only ever meet musicians, and right now in coronavirus, like I'm at home all the time. I'm not like I'm, I'm not a student anymore, so I can't be mm-hmm. meeting people I'm going to school with. Right, right. Like, and the the positive is like this person who I am seeing right now is not a musician, which I love. Like, I love um, having somebody who is totally different. Mm-hmm. He's a lawyer, so it was like a totally different knowledge set and you know perspectives and all of that. Um, 
and that just like wasn't I don't imagine any chance of meeting this person because I mean I do like to go out but even then it's like I would rather be with close friends like I, mm. I'm not trying to if I meet people e even if I do talk to strangers I'm not looking for something in that regard um mm -hmm. and so there so that's the positive side of this thing and then there's the negative of these like psychological implications of uh, just the it's, it's kind of annoying too because that's how my generation is dating right now like that's mm -hmm. you know it used to be like it was socially awkward to get online but now it's like this is how people are dating this is the norm um culture the cultural norm and it's, so now it's even harder to talk to somebody who you meet in person and it's even harder to um i don't know just I don't know what I'm saying, but it's so it's it's creating these like boundaries and the way we communicate. Um, and I, I don't have answers to this, but I'm just saying that there's good and bad sides to the whole thing. Yeah, no, I, I totally That's agree. Um, well, Gloria, this I have really enjoyed catching up with you. And I got to say, I'm, I'm really glad to see that. Uh, it, at least it, my perception is that you are feeling like you have both feet on something more solid than you did six months ago, just personally, but also just in I terms do. of how society is, how you're functioning in society. And uh, <laughs> I'm, I, I don't want to say I'm relieved because it's not like I was worried. You know, you're, you, you're somebody who's proactive. You reached out to me like that. That tells me initially, like, she's going to be fine. Like, Gloria's going to be OK. Like, there's a million other people in the world that I students I have who I'm like far more worried about than you, Gloria. Um, and you're not my student at all, yeah, but thanks. just in terms of the people that I, that I interact with, um, it seems to me like you're, you're really trying to process this stuff genuinely. And I appreciate your vulnerability and your willingness to talk about these really personal issues and the door's always open. So, you know, this is our second one. Yeah. Hopefully after 20 years, we've done 15 or 20 of these and you know, you'll be an old lady and I'll be an old man. And then we one can... One day we'll meet in person as well. Yes, yes. Well, I will really look forward to that. In the meantime, Gloria, please, uh, where what's the Kickstarter website? So, Or what's the name of the project again? So folks, if they wanted to look up the Kickstarter project, could. So Dreamerfly, like dream or -er, F-L-Y. Okay. Um, and other stories. But if you just type in Dreamerfly, it's, it's kind of a word we made up for this project that we like. Okay. And how close are you to your funding goal? You know, actually, we just passed it, but it's uh, stretch yeah, goal just time. yesterday. Um, but I'm about to put up a stretch goal because we want to we want to pay someone properly to mix the audio. We're not 100 percent happy with the mixes we have right now. Hmm. So we're going to have somebody else go through the stems and like mix and master it. Awesome. Um, and yeah, some of the expenses were especially on this side of the, the world in California, I, um, when I first made the budget, I underestimated them. So mm. we need to, so basically I, I, um, my artist fee went to that. So if we mm. can overfund this, then I might get paid. Maybe that's important, Gloria. I think it's <laughs> that important be, that, you know, it's, <laughs> that would be really nice. Listen, art is very <laughs> satisfying. I don't want to be disingenuous here. Making art is great. You know, what's also satisfying a hoagie sandwich yeah, that you purchase with your own money and can put in your belly like like that. And it's nice to make yeah. that money doing things that you want to do rather than mowing lawns or shoveling, you know, snow. So, um, right. And I'm, I'm hoping to be able to pay my own rent again in the next like couple months. So this would help. Well, let's let's recuperate some of the, the let's for that. let's plan on touching base again sooner than later. Um, I like sort of catching in with catching up with people and tracking progress as we go in real time. So um, if, if the next time you got something that comes up, cool. don't hesitate to reach out. Otherwise, uh, stay. It was lovely to chat with you, Gloria. Stay safe and healthy. And I'll look forward to the next time. Thanks. You too. All right. Bye bye. Yeah. Same to you. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that conversation. This podcast is brought to you by Liquid Drum, liquiddrum.com down in Waco, Texas. Uh, my good friend Todd Meehan runs an amazing percussion company down there. Great merch, great content. Check him out, liquiddrum.com. Also, Kyle Dunleavy, dunleavypans.com, D-U-N-L-E-A-V-Y pans.com. Kyle Dunleavy makes and builds all the steel drums that I perform and teach on, uh, and so percussion, as well as at NYU and Princeton. Uh, he's an amazing, amazing tuner builder, um, just a really nice guy, very dependable. Check him out. If you are interested at all in steel pan advocacy, 
uh, want to learn more about the goings on uh, in Pan in Brooklyn, check out paninmotion.com. My good friend Kendall Williams, uh, Jerry Guy, Trisha Guy, and uh, Arisha John run an amazing organization called paninmotion.com. Check them out. And finally, Aleandre Mirage runs an amazing uh, clothing apparel company in Brooklyn that is steel pan centric. You can check him out at mango chow, C H O W clothing.com. I own a bunch of his shirts. They're amazing, very stylish, uh, beautiful, beautifully made. Check them out. Mango chow clothing.com. Okay, hope you're well. Talk to you soon.